Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, Operation Fly Formula. The White House says it now has a plan to end the baby formula shortage as more manufacturers issue a warning about how long the crisis could last. The president taking action to ramp up production and even going overseas to get more supplies for American families. And I've directed my team to do everything possible to ensure there's enough safe baby formula and that it is quickly reaching families that need it the most. This comes as the House passes bills aimed at combating the shortage. We'll tell you why they faced a partisan split. Plus, when parents could finally see more formula on the shelves. Wall Street woes. The Dow suffers its worst drop in nearly two years with big retail names like Target and Walmart reporting stunning drops in profit for the first part of the year. What this means for your wallet and if the Dow can rebound by the end of the day. Setbacks. Vladimir Putin's wider goals in the war in Ukraine have faltered, with Ukrainian troops pushing back in the eastern part of the country, despite Russians gaining control of Mariupol, the other factors that could slow the Russians' plans in the war. Plus, supersized order. A woman gets a surprise delivery of 31 cheeseburgers, and she didn't have to look far to see who was behind it, how her toddler was able to make that order later this hour. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever we start the day, I mean, 7 a.m., talking McDonald's cheeseburgers, it just now sets you, me off. Do you want 31 of day. them is the question. You know, I do love <laughs> that like, little cheeseburger. <laughs> I couldn't quite eat 31, but I could eat maybe a handful. Three. Maybe okay. Okay. Well, All right. So, all right, though. We'll get to that later. It's really funny. You want to stick around. We begin, though, this morning with the latest on the baby formula shortage impacting families across the country. And now Washington is taking action to try to ease the crisis. Later today, FDA Commissioner Robert Califf will testify before Congress to discuss his agency's response to the shortage. The FDA says it will take weeks to replenish baby formula stock on sh in stores that have been but see mostly empty shelves recently. In response on Wednesday, President Biden invoked the Defense Production Act to boost the supply of formula. The Defense Production Act gives the government the ability to require suppliers to direct needed resources to infant formula manufacturers before any other customer who may have ordered that good. Overnight, the House passed two bills to cut red tape for parents buying formula with government assistance and to provide more funding to the FDA, which oversees safety at the plants that make formula. We have team coverage of this crisis. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa and NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman. Good morning to both of you. Ali, we'll start with you and those votes in the House. What was in both of those bills and what can we expect going forward? Yeah, Joe. Well, you know, Congress and the White House, as you mentioned, have been under a lot of pressure to act quicker to help alleviate this crisis. And Congress actually acted quicker than we thought. We thought these two votes would happen today. They happened late last night. The first of these bills passed almost unanimously, and it would expand access to formula during shortages like this. Uh, so more formula can be purchased with money from the WIC program. That's that program for low-income women, infant, and children. The other bill to send $28 million in emergency aid to the FDA to, as you mentioned, essentially cut uh, government red tape to make it easier for companies to manufacture this formula to get it on shelves. This bill was much more divided. All House Democrats voted for this, but only about a dozen Republicans voted for it. So both of these bills now head to the Senate. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said that he's hoping to get this passed today. As, as with so much legislation that we see in this 50-50 Senate, we're already uh, hearing of some roadblocks with Republicans. Actually, uh, Senator Marco Rubio just tweeted a couple minutes ago, the Democrat $28 million baby formula bill is a joke. We don't have a baby formula demand crisis. We have a baby formula supply crisis. So if that is a preview of what's to come on the Senate floor when this is voted on, uh, this is just really a preview of that, Jeff. Yeah, so Josh, let's talk about the source of this. It was a contamination incident that forced an Abbott baby formula plant to shut down, really creating this situation. What's the latest on that and what else beyond the Defense Production Act is the president doing to try and ramp up supply? 
Well, earlier this week, the FDA reached a legally binding agreement with Abbott, that company that runs that plant in Michigan, to get it back up and running once the factory has undergone essentially a checklist that the government has set out for what they need to do, including, including inspections, testing of their equipment and ingredients, as well as bringing in a third party to monitor to make sure they are doing everything by the book. Once that's in place, the factory says uh, it could be back up and running in about two weeks and it would take take about six to eight weeks for product from that factory to reach store shelves. Uh, to Surgeon General Vivek Murthy explaining that this is an all hands on deck effort. Take a listen. What people should also know is that from the president on down, everyone is laser focused on addressing this issue and pulling every lever possible to do so. That's why we are working now to import formula from abroad to get manufacturers to increase production here, to get the plant, plant that was actually shut down back online quickly, and to actually redistribute product within the United States. Ali, we mentioned the FDA commissioner is going to be testifying today. Are other hearings in the works? And help us understand just how much pressure lawmakers are putting on the FDA to try and address this shortage. Well, this is just the latest of several hearings that uh, several committees have called for in response to this, this nationwide shortage. And this hearing will really give lawmakers the biggest window, the biggest insight into what caused this problem up until this point um, and give the lawmakers as much information as possible as to how this crisis got so bad, why it took so long to sound the alarm, and really what could be put into place so that it never gets this bad again. We know that FDA Commissioner Rob Robert Califf is expected to come back also next week on May 25th uh, before the Energy and Commerce Committee. He's expected to appear with other FDA officials as well as the uh, top heads of the four major formula manufacturing companies. Uh, that's after several committees asked last week for documentation and just evidence of really what's going on and how this crisis got so bad. So this is really uh, just a reflection of this all hands on deck effort from Congress. We've seen some disagreement as to how to help alleviate this crisis, but for the most part, just bipartisan agreement over the fact that something needs to be done and it needs to be done very quickly, Joe. Allie Raffar, thanks to you and to Josh Letterman for kicking us off this now, Wall Street is looking to rebound today after suffering its worst drop in two years. Yesterday, the Dow Jones dropped more than 1,100 points to finish at its lowest close since March 2021. And it wasn't just the Dow, though. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq also suffered in a miserable day of trading, slipping by more than 4 percent. Joining us now for more on this is Caleb Silver. He's the editor-in-chief at Investopedia. Caleb, good morning. Thanks for joining us. I mean, I know we all know we've been on a roller coaster with the market. In fact, just yesterday we were reporting how there had been a better day, but there's been a lot of bad days and now this. So why was there such a big sell-off yesterday? And also, do you think we're in for a repeat performance today or could we see a rebound? Yeah, we're looking at stock futures pointing much lower again this morning, about 1.5% down. The trading in Asia was terrible. Europe's not looking much better. So we're probably going to get another sell-off to start the day. We'll see if buyers come in in the afternoon. We have not seen that lately. We've seen these really big pronounced down days, followed by a couple percent up the next mm -hmm. day, followed by 2 or 3% down. That's what you get in a mixed volatility, uncertain environment, and that's what we're in right now. Yesterday, it was the retailers driving down markets. Target reporting very soft earnings. Walmart the day before. Shares of Target fell 25% yesterday, the worst drop since 1987, Black Monday, when the stock market crashed. So investors don't want any part of this uncertainty. And that uncertainty is about inflation, rising interest rates, and the worries that we're going to head into a recession and consumers are not going to continue spending. And Caleb, what do those big name earning reports really tell us about the American consumer? How are we feeling? How are we spending? And what does that mean? Well, consumers have been pretty resilient for the past year and a half, two years. A part of that was because the personal savings rate hit an all-time high amid the pandemic due to those government distributions. But lately, we're seeing consumer spending back off a little bit. What Target was telling us in Walmart the other day is that consumers are now bargain shopping. They're spending less when they go into their stores, and they're going into their stores less frequently. Plus, these retailers are dealing with their own input costs and inflation. Producer prices are up 10 percent. Consumer inflation is up 8.5 percent. So they're worried that consumers are not going to keep spending mm. at the pace that they were. Meanwhile, their own costs are rising, including wages.
Right. Now, Caleb, this is actually the fifth time this year the Dow Jones has finished down more than 800 points in a day. Obviously, that can lead to a lot of stress and nerves for a lot of people who are watching their investments, thinking about their retirement. But what's your take on the overall market and where it's headed? What's your advice for people listening at home who are waking up stressed about this? Yeah, everyone's stressed about it. And if you need the money you have in the stock market in the next year or two, the stock market was probably in the, the, the worst place for it to be right now. But you know what? Markets usually revert to the mean. And the mean is a rise of between 8 and 10% a year on average going back 80 years. It's not going to happen in 2022. We're in a bear market. We're going to open the day with the S&P 500 down 20% from all-time highs. That said, at some point, stocks revert Investors come back in, and we're going to get some sort of a rebound, but it's not going to be anytime soon. We could be in this slow, volatile environment for many months to come. For younger investors, great opportunity mm. to pick up new stocks at a bargain price. For older investors, you want to pare back a little bit and think about maybe putting your money in cash or into value stocks because that's where the action is. Super choppy, and it's going to be this way for a while. All right, Caleb, we always appreciate the good practical advice. Thank you so much. Let's turn now to the war in Ukraine, where more soldiers who were trapped inside a Mariupol steel plant are surrendering to Russian forces. Russia's defense ministry now says since Monday, more than 1,700 fighters have surrendered. The soldiers have been taken to Russian-held territory, but there's uncertainty over what comes next. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray has more from Lviv. Savannah, Joe, good morning. And look, the focus continues to be on Mariupol and specifically the Azovstal steel plant where the evacuation of Ukraine fighters does continue. Russian media now saying that there are more than a thousand Ukraine troops that have surrendered their arms and, and have been taken into custody uh, by Russian troops on the ground there. Amnesty International very concerned about the safety and well-being of those soldiers now in Russian custody and has asked that the U.N. get involved to try and make sure that they are being treated properly. Uh, this is a situation that will continue to unfold over the next several days. As we've talked about, they are hoping here in Ukraine for a prisoner swap to bring those soldiers back into friendly territory. They call them heroes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the first war crime in this uh, country. A 21-year-old Russian soldier pleading guilty uh, to killing a six 62-year-old man while he was riding his bike said he did that after a command from his superior. Uh, he now faces a sentence of either 10 to 15 years in jail or life in prison. A three-judge panel is determining that. The Kremlin, though, they haven't been real engaged in this, haven't said anything specifically about this trial. And when it comes to the issue of war crimes by Russian troops, they say the reports are, quoting here, obvious fakes. That's the latest here in Ukraine. Back to you now. Jay Gray, thank you so much. For more on this, we want to bring in John Herbst. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and a senior director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. So I want to start with news that you are specifically uniquely qualified to talk about, which is the fact that the Senate has confirmed Bridget Brink as the new U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, of course, a position that you held, as I just mentioned. And this comes as the U.S. officially reopened its embassy in Kiev. So talk to us about the kind of challenges she's going to face taking over this job in the middle of this war. Correct. This is a really tough assignment, and I am as jealous as hell. Um, this is what foreign service officers live for. Mm. She's a tough, strong, smart professional who will do an outstanding job, but she's going to have to provide Washington with the very clear information about what's going on in Ukraine as Ukraine fights this massive Kremlin invasion, and as Washington gears up unprecedented but absolutely necessary support to stop Russia, to beat Russia in Ukraine. Absolutely. It's good to hear you say something like that, actually, because it just proves the type of people that are in these jobs want to be doing this work and are there to make it better to get through. So now we're almost three months into a war that really, I mean, I was not, I'm surprised to hear you say you're jealous that she's having to deal with this. But I mean, I think it proves your point that this is the type of thing that you live for. Um, now I want to ask you about sort of what we're seeing happening on the ground and the fact that a lot of this seems to be backfiring on Vladimir Putin and his plans. I mean, let's tick some of these reasons off. Russian troops are being forced back from positions in eastern Ukraine, including the second largest city, Kharkiv. The country's also been totally isolated, hammered with these sanctions. And then also we're now seeing formerly historically neutral Sweden and Finland set to join NATO. What is Putin's endgame at this point? And, and all of this stacking up, I mean, what does this mean for the Russian people? 
You're exactly right that this new invasion of Ukraine, or three-month-old invasion of Ukraine, is a strategic disaster for Russia and for Putin. Uh, unfortunately, he is the guy who makes the decisions in Moscow, and he still seems to think he can subjugate Ukraine. He has not given up his goals, although he's adjusted them to focus on the East right now, although not very successfully. Until he's persuaded that he cannot win this on the ground militarily in Ukraine, this war is going to continue. And that's very sad mm. for Ukraine especially, but also for Russian soldiers. Oh, absolutely. Now, since the beginning of the war, many experts have noted the fact that the the UN and EU have put forward this united front NATO, but strongman leaders from within those groups are pushing back. The president of Turkey blocked a vote to quickly move ahead with NATO membership for Finland and Sweden. And the president of Hungary has rallied against an embargo of Russian oil. How much of an impact can these leaders have on the Western response? Or, or what does that mean, for example, as we're looking at Sweden potentially joining NATO? First, I would distinguish between Erdogan in Turkey and Orban in Hungary. Orban has essentially been an agent of Putin over the last several years, I'm sorry to say. Um, Erdogan is just a difficult and mercurial strongman. Mm. Erdogan wants to use fin Finland and Sweden as members of NATO as, as a way to get something from, from the West. So he's going to bargain for something. I'm sure that we'll make a deal. Uh, but I believe that we can manage the problems that Erdogan and Erdogan create as long as U.S. leadership is strong and active. So I, I am I'm confident that we'll be able to move policy the right way mm. within NATO and for that matter, the help with the EU. Ambassador John Herbst, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Still too close to call this morning in Pennsylvania's Republican Senate primary. A little more than 1,200 votes separate Dr. Mehmet Oz from former Wall Street executive David McCormick with 98 percent of the vote counted. The winner will face Democrat John Fetterman in November in what is expected to be one of the most competitive and expensive races this cycle. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us now from a ballot counting facility in Delaware County. Dasha, good morning to you. So before that big general election matchup, we need a GOP nominee. So how many votes are left to count? Where are they coming from? And does the where tell us who those votes might go to? <laughs> All great questions, Joe. Good morning. I'm having some flashbacks to 2020, the last time we were talking about this and explaining the process here in Pennsylvania. So the vast majority of ballots left to count are mail-in ballots. Here in Pennsylvania, it's one of the few states that does not allow what's called pre-canvassing, which basically means preparing those mail-in ballots to be counted, opening up the envelopes, uh, unfolding the ballots, getting them ready to uh, get scanned. They can't start doing that here in Pennsylvania until 7 a.m. on Election Day. So those are the ballots that we're still waiting for. From, from what we know, about 15,000 or so mail-in ballots are still left to be counted. There's also some same-day vote left in Allegheny County and on the western part of Pennsylvania and here uh, in the Philadelphia area. Uh, those mail, uh, day of votes are coming from some memory sticks that you know weren't necessarily taken out of the machines and delivered. Not, uh, not anything to be concerned about. Just again, it's a human process. People take some time to get these things done. Um, and there are also some provisional ballots left as well. Um, to your question of, of what does this mean for who might get the lead, we really don't know. Look, uh, McCormick has been leading in mail-in ballots, but will that be enough for him to actually overtake Oz? Uh, it's really hard to say what we do know from every election official, every election expert that I've spoken with. It is very, very, very likely that this is headed into recount territory, Joe. Thankfully, we have you, our human memory stick, who knows exactly how things work in Pennsylvania <laughs> from, from the 2000 race. So I want to ask you, former President Trump is actually calling on his pick, Dr. Oz, to declare victory right now, yeah. even though, as you say, a recount's possible, of course. Trump prematurely declared victory hours after the polls closed in 2020. So what are we actually hearing from the campaigns right now? Yeah, again, deja vu. We're in Pennsylvania. We're waiting for mail-in ballots to be counted, and President Trump is trying to sow doubt uh, in the process here again. Uh, look, Oz has not yet declared victory in the way that Trump uh, is telling him he should do, but both campaigns have certainly been signaling optimism. Take a listen to what both Oz and McCormick said on Fox News last night. You know, we have covered all counties to ensure that the ballots are correctly counted. This election is ours. We have done well. 
But I want to do today, though, is to, is to talk about unifying our party, because those three frontrunners and their other candidates as well all work their tails off. But we need to get, unite to take on Fetterman, who you mentioned earlier. And I am praying that he makes a full recovery. And our campaign had put a lot of energy and time into focusing on these absentee voters and focusing on our ground game. And, uh, and so that has paid off uh, big dividends. And uh, there's a huge number of absentee uh, ballots, which uh, we're winning disproportionately. And that's why I have a lot of confidence I'm going to win this. So, yeah, both signaling optimism, but uh, no doubt both campaigns are preparing for a recount, Joe. And Dasha, quickly, if this does go to a recount, what should we expect? How long does that take? That's a great question. It could take a while. Both of these campaigns have spent millions and millions of dollars here, so they are not going to go down without a fight. And some election experts I've been speaking with say, look, because this is the most high-profile recount Pennsylvania will have ever had, things could get ugly, things could get contentious, and that could draw out the process. And election officials are always frustrated by recounts because it is uh, using taxpayer money. It's rare that a recount actually turns up a different result. But in this case, we could be looking at potentially a couple hundred votes difference between these two candidates. And that's kind of in the territory where a recount could make a difference. Everything is up in the air right now, just as this uh, race has been uh, full of twists and turns from the start. The twists and turns continue even after Election Day. We could be looking at a couple more weeks, potentially, before we have a final outcome here. I feel like it'll be a year of twists and turns. All right, Dasha Burns. Dasha, thanks so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Certainly. All right, now it's time for a check on your morning news now weather. Michelle Grossman is with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. And we're looking at that heat continuing once again in the south. I know, 90s and 100s. Look at you. look like sunshine. It's Perfect for it. Well, can I tell a little secret? I just spilled my entire oh, oh, wow. on my dress. Your secret's safe with That's, us. Yeah. Yeah. And the entire cup of coffee on the dress. So okay. I well, it's on the back. We would have never known, but we love the honesty. Felt like I had to tell you. you know, I love it. It smells. That's what smells I would have done. Yeah. All right. So let's do, let's take a look at the map today because we are looking at severe storms in the upper Midwest. We're going to see the chance of some hail, some damaging winds, also a few tornadoes. Record highs continue. 90s and 100s once again. We're going to see that through the early part of the weekend and then we get a little bit of a break a storm off to the pacific northwest we're looking at higher elevation snow that's going to move into the rockies we can see a lot of snow in the rockies this weekend and the morning rain in the northeast that's going to be moving out could be lingering to around lunchtime in some spots so near record highs once again 10 to 20 degrees above what is typical for this time of year 92 in memphis 99 in dodge city 103 in midland so this is a wide swath of really warm air in place atlanta we're looking at 93 and 90 degrees in myrtle Myr Myr Certainly, many of records are going to be broken today. Now, as we go throughout tomorrow, this expands to the Ohio Valley. So, Cleveland, you're looking at 93. Your record is 91 tomorrow. Nashville, you're in the 90s. Atlanta, Charleston, also Richmond. And then by the weekend, Friday into Saturday, we are looking at really warm conditions in the Northeast. So, as we look at New York City, temperatures in the mid 80s, Saturday and Sunday, a cold front comes through. That's going to bring more comfortable conditions. Hot to not. I like that producer put that on there. 71 on Monday. <laughs> and uh, Raleigh, we're looking at temperatures into the 90s, 81 by Sunday. So here's your severe weather threat for today. 29 million people at risk. We have two areas where we're going to see the chance for severe weather. One is in the upper Midwest. We do have an enhanced risk. That's where it's likely to see severe weather. La Crosse, Des Moines, you are included in that. Then we have a pretty large swath from St. Louis all the way to Nashville, Knoxville, Char uh, Charlotte, into Raleigh. Tomorrow we're going to see 22 million people at risk. Again, winds gusting to 60 miles per hour. Damaging hail and also the chance for an isolated tornado. So this is a setup. We have a pair of cold fronts that are going to move through. First, we're going to see that first when bringing the storms in the southeast. That secondary cold front kind of takes hold tomorrow. It's going to be the more active one tomorrow, bringing a uh, more dominant, bringing storms erupting from Michigan all the way to Texas. And then we'll see showers and storms, you guys, into the Ohio Valley on Saturday. Wow. Oh, there's always a lot going on. Yeah, exactly. I like that from hot to not. Yeah, I love it too. I was like, that's so cute. I just yeah. noticed it now. <laughs> Worried about the Your producers always have the cool stuff on the ground. Yeah. yeah. All right, Michelle, thanks. See you in a bit. Thanks, Coming up, the alleged gunman in the Buffalo supermarket shooting will be back in a courtroom today. The new information we're expecting to learn this morning at the hearing, plus the new steps lawmakers in New York are taking, hoping to prevent another tragedy. And health officials are saying if COVID rates are high in your area, now's the time to mask up again. So could more control measures becoming what doctors are expecting from this COVID surge. That's next. Back now with the latest on the Buffalo shooting. The man accused of the deadly racially motivated attack is due in court this morning. He's charged with one count of first degree murder in the shooting. 
which killed 10 people. And now New York's Governor Kathy Hochul is taking steps to help put a stop to acts of domestic terrorism. I'm signing an executive order to establish a unit within the Office of Counterterrorism at the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, focusing exclusively on domestic terrorism, first time ever. They'll develop the best practices for law enforcement, for mental health professionals, for school officials to address the rise in homegrown extremism. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett joins us from Buffalo. So Maura, what can we expect, first of all, from today's hearing? Good morning, Joe. Today is the felony hearing for the suspected shooter. He will be in court today, though we don't expect to see him on camera right now. Basically, this is the first step in the court process here in Erie County, where the judge will review whether or not there is enough evidence to go to trial. As you mentioned, there is that one count, uh, one charge of first degree murder. But once it goes to the next step, if passed through today, they will go to a grand jury where the county DA says he expects more charges to be brought. We're also expecting potential charges. Charges uh, from the federal side as well. But as it stands right now, if it goes to trial with this one count, he's facing a maximum sentence of life in prison with no option of parole. So, Maura, the House just passed a domestic terrorism bill last night, and the Senate is expected to vote next week on that. I also just mentioned the fact that New York Governor Kathy Hochul introduced her own plan yesterday here in the state to address the growing threat of white supremacist groups and domestic terrorism. Break down some of the key points of that plan. Right, so Governor Hochul actually signed in two executive orders yesterday, one dealing with reporting uh, about red flag laws, making it mandatory for police to report any suspected uh, people who might be a threat, because that's not what we saw go into effect with the shooter here with the New York uh, red flag laws, right? So that's something that police say that they're anticipating being a really effective step. But the other thing that Hochul wanted to focus on was the white supremacy aspect and domestic terrorism. She's saying that's actually the most serious threat compared to guns. I want to hear a little bit about what she said to press yesterday. The truth is the most serious threat we face as a nation is from within. It's not from the Russians. It's not from people elsewhere. It's white supremacism. It's white nationalism. And it's time we confronted it head on. So this domestic terrorism task force will be a further step to prevent against what we saw happen here this weekend. Like you heard earlier, it will focus on the proper training to to alert to when someone might be uh, planning something like this, as well as training for mental and social emotional resources. It is important to note, though, that New York did already have a domestic terrorism committee in place that was put into place by Governor Cuomo. Uh, they were required to meet four times a year, but had not met at all prior to this. And so Governor Hochul trying to prevent something like this from happening again and making it a more serious priority. And more investigators say the suspect posted his plans on an online service called Discord 30 minutes before mm. the shooting. We know it was live streamed on Twitch. Governor Hochul now having State Attorney General Letitia James probe social media's role in the Buffalo shooting. Very quickly here, how extensive could this probe be? We expect it to be very extensive, right, because it wasn't just that video that invited users to watch the live stream on Twitch. It was months and months of reported planning on websites like 4chan, 8chan, Twitch, and Discord. And so Letitia James saying she's going to be probing very seriously, as she said uh, in a release, the fact that an individual can post detailed plans to commit such an act of hate without consequence and then stream it for the world to see is bone chilling and unfathomable. Uh, Discord releasing a statement overnight saying that they are are cooperating with this investigation. Now, Joe and Savannah, this all comes right as uh, the funerals are set to start for victims tomorrow. Okay, Maura Barrett, thank you so much. Now to some new guidance from the CDC. It probably sounds like old guidance from the CDC. They say anyone living in areas with high COVID transmissibility should start wearing masks indoors again as cases and hospitalization rates continue to rise. Now, 32% of the country is currently living in medium to high risk COVID areas. That number is up from 24% just a week ago. But CDC Director Rochelle Walensky says stopping the spread is possible. 
We've seen with um, prior increases infections in, in, um, in you know, different waves of infection have demonstrated that this travels across the country and has the potential to travel across the country. So I, I think the important thing to recognize is that we actually have the tools um, to prevent it. And so we would ask you to wisely use these tools. The CDC is also set to meet later today to discuss the future of COVID booster shots for kids 5 to 11 years old. The agency is expected to recommend the dose following the FDA's authorization earlier this week. Dr. Anand Swami Nathan joins us now for more on the latest COVID headlines. He's an assistant professor of emergency medicine at St. Joseph's Hospital. Doctor, always good to have you with us. So did you expect COVID protocols like masking to return while dealing with these Omicron subvariants? And how much worse could this wave get? I think what we hoped was that these kind of mandates or recommendations would have returned a while ago. We've seen rising cases for weeks now. And the problem of starting masking when you already have high transmission is you've kind of missed the boat already. And so in the Northeast, where high transmission is kind of the norm across that Northeast area, it's a little too late. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't benefit by masking in public, but we've missed the boat a little bit. And what I would recommend is all of the other parts of the country that aren't facing those huge numbers start indoor masking now to prevent getting into that area. That's really what we should be pushing for. I think this recommendation is just far too late and many public health experts have been calling for a return to indoor masking for weeks to help to stem the tide. Now, doctor, as more people test positive, it might be helpful to do a little reminder on what exactly that means that you should be doing, because unfortunately, some of the rules here are still confusing. We've talked about this. Is it 10 days at home? Is it five days at home? Do you have to have a negative test to test out of quarantine? So even two years into the pandemic, I think this is helpful. Tell us what you should be doing if you test positive. What do we need to remember? I think the first thing to do is to try as much as you can to isolate at home, to not go out into public, to spread this to others. Within the home as well, I think people think once one family member gets it, everybody else is going to get it. Mm. That's not a foregone conclusion. The data tells us only about 50% of household contacts will get COVID. So you can still do things to prevent your family members from getting it, like masking indoors, having windows open to increase ventilation. And then as far as returning, the CDC has recommendations here. They don't completely make sense, though. What we should be doing is a test to return. If you're positive, test yourself on day four or five. If your test is negative, you can probably go back to your usual things. Even better is to do two tests in a row, but don't expect that you're gonna be negative at five days and you don't need to do that test. That test to return to normal life or, or to get back out into the world is really important to help to stem the tide because we're seeing more and more people who are positive up to date eight, nine, and even 10. And quickly, doctor, we wanna ask you about a new report which found more than three quarters of patients who suffered from long COVID they weren't initially hospitalized after they got infected. So what does that tell you about the virus? What it tells us is that long COVID is not only real, but it's common even if you didn't have a severe case. And we're seeing that up to 50% of people who had COVID are continuing to have long COVID symptoms up to six months later. This is just another reason that we should be trying to avoid getting infection at all, that the idea of, well, you know, Omicron doesn't seem so bad, let it rip, let's see what happens, doesn't really take into account the risks of developing long COVID symptoms. And I will tell you that many of the friends and family that I have still are reporting even 12 months, 18 months later, changes in their taste, changes in fatigue. These are real things that we are only going to learn more about in the coming years. Seeing that so many people are suffering from it, even when they had mild cases, is really concerning. Important message there. All right, Dr. Swami Nathan, as always, thank you so much. Thank you. And coming up, now that Amber Heard is off the stand, we're hearing from friends and family in the defamation trial brought on by ex-husband Johnny Depp. We're going to tell you what people close to Heard revealed about the allegations of abuse next. We're back with new developments in the ongoing federal criminal probe into Hunter Biden's finances. NBC News Now anchor Hallie Jackson has the details of how the president's son paid off a nearly $2 million IRS bill in this NBC News Investigates report. The president's son under growing scrutiny over his finances with federal prosecutors in Delaware investigating Hunter Biden and whether he broke federal tax law. Now, a representative for Mr. Biden tells NBC News his bill from the IRS, about $2 million, has been paid off. Two people familiar with the matter say the money was arranged by one of the younger Biden's new attorneys, Hollywood lawyer Kevin Morris, best known for brokering a deal for the South Park TV show. Does paying that tax bill wash away any liability that Hunter Biden may have now? 
paying the tax bill, if in fact that's what he did, doesn't undo the crime. It would be like returning money to a bank that you robbed. You still rob the bank. The president's son and his company brought in about $11 million between 2013 and 2018, including some years in which his father was vice president, working as an attorney, a board member to a Ukrainian gas company accused of bribing a prosecutor, and for a joint venture involving a Chinese businessman now accused of fraud, according to an NBC News analysis of a copy of Biden's hard drive and iCloud account, as well as documents released by a Senate committee. During the campaign, then-candidate Joe Biden denied his son profited off a China connection. My son has not made money in terms of this thing about, uh, what are you talking about, China. The records show Hunter Biden's company received nearly $5 million in consulting contracts from that joint venture funded by a Chinese energy company. A snapshot of Hunter Biden's spending shows that for about five months in late 2017 and early 2018, he spent more than $200,000 a month on things like luxury hotel rooms, cash withdrawals, dental work, and payments on a Porsche, according to documents on the hard drive, a time period in which Hunter Biden has acknowledged struggling with drug addiction. The immediate focus appears to be for both the president and Hunter Biden is whether or not there'll be any charges as a result of this federal criminal investigation. Hunter Biden's laptop, a subject of controversy after documents recovered from it were brought to light by the Biden's political opponents, with some cybersecurity experts at one point in 2020 suggesting it bore hallmarks of a Russian disinformation campaign. Since then, several news organizations have authenticated many emails from the laptop, and NBC News obtained a copy of the hard drive from a representative for Rudy Giuliani. The president has defended his son. I'm confident. And Hunter Biden has denied any illegal business dealings. I'm cooperating um, completely. And I am absolutely certain, 100 percent certain, that at the end of the investigation, that I will be cleared of any wrongdoing. Experts point out family members of a president who hold no official job in the administration are not bound by any government ethics rules. Hunter Biden seems a lot like somebody whose primary profession is being Joe Biden's son. Uh, but unless there's a direct connection to Joe Biden, that's really more of a criticism of one private citizen rather than a government official or an administration. Hunter Biden's attorney did not comment on the record, and the White House has not responded to our request for comment. Hallie Jackson, thank you. Now, it was another long day of testimony in the defamation trial involving actor Johnny Depp and ex-wife Amber Heard. On Wednesday, the jury heard from friends and family. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has the latest as the trial nears an end. Amber Heard's contentious time on the stand, followed by fresh bombshells from friends and family. He called her a f used up trash bag, uh, slimy, <laughs> saggy, uh, just, you know, <laughs> was thrown out a bunch. Heard's younger sister, Whitney Henriquez, giving graphic testimony saying Depp was constantly high, drunk, and violent, including one incident where she says he hit her. He comes up behind me, strikes me in the back, kind of just somewhere over here. He strikes me in the back. I hear Amber shout, don't hit my sister. She smacks him, lands one. Depp previously denied striking Henriquez. Heard admitted to hitting Depp as a way to defend her sister. Henriquez testifying along with a procession of witnesses called by Heard's lawyers to paint Depp as a paranoid abuser who would often launch into blind rages. He ran into the unit and it scared the shit out of me because he was wasted and screaming. I was worried for her physical safety. I was worried that when he turned, he might accidentally do something that was worse than he ever intended. Heard's former friend Raquel Pennington, who took several pictures of Heard following alleged abuse, getting emotional in pre-recorded testimony while describing injuries she saw on Heard's face and body. Does this picture fairly and accurately depict, um, at least in part, Miss Heard's appearance on that night in December 15, 2015? Yeah. Yes. Also today, Heard's makeup artist testifying she concealed bruises. We covered, you know, the, the discoloration, the bruises, 
with a little slightly heavier concealer. It's the latest chapter in the $50 million defamation suit brought by Johnny Depp after a 2018 op-ed published in the Washington Post where Heard described herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Heard countersuing for $100 million. Earlier in the trial, Depp's legal team called witnesses they believed would poke holes in the claims made by Heard. Are you able to testify whether Amber Heard was the victim of domestic violence by Mr. Depp on May 21, 2016? Uh, based on our investigation, it appeared as if she was not. So far, no one has testified they saw Depp hit Heard, but Heard's attorneys highlighting specific incidents where witnesses testified they had to intervene in fights. She was calling for help, and that had never happened before, saying, help, help me. And I went up to him, and he was yelling and yelling, and I just, I put my hands up on his chest, and I was like, stop, just stop. Our thanks to Steve Patterson for that report. Now, Johnny Depp is listed as a potential witness for the defense, and he may take the stand again in the coming days. Closing arguments are scheduled for next week. Up next, six months ago, world leaders gathered in Scotland to find ways to combat climate change. Yeah, they came up with ambitious green energy goals, but have they followed through with them? We'll take a look at how they're doing. That's up next in Climate Control. Back now with financial headlines and Wall Street feeling the pressure today following yesterday's sell-off. That's right. Bertha Coombs joins us now with the latest on that. Hey, Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe and Savannah. It looks like we're going to start the day in the red again, although here's the glass half full. Right now, it looks like the Dow could open down about 280 points. It looked earlier like it was going to be down 450, so it's gotten a little bit better. Yesterday, we saw the Dow fall more than 1,100 points for its worst day in nearly two years. Shares of Target is really why they're down again today after they lost 25 percent yesterday yesterday following disappointing earnings from the retailer. It was the worst day for the company since the Black Monday stock market crash back in October of 1987. This morning, we're going to be watching for a couple of important economic gauges. We'll get jobless claims at 8.30 Eastern, along with existing home sales. Plus, we are watching more earnings from retailers. We just got results from Kohl's. They were disappointing as well. It's a tough time right now in retail. Less than 20% of Americans, though, with retirement or investment accounts, say that they plan to increase their stock holdings this year. According to a new survey from Bankrate, roughly 70% say that they're just going to maintain or maybe decrease their stock investments. More than half of investors have taken no action at all in response to all of the market volatility we've seen so far. Just 14% bought more stocks, while 16% moved money out of stocks. And inflation apparently hasn't affected their actions either, with nearly two-thirds making no moves in response to higher prices. But one positive note to leave you on this morning, we might have seen a peak of inflation when it comes to chicken wings. The CEO of Wingstop says there's been a meaningful decrease in the price of chicken wings. He tells our CNBC, Jim Kramer, wings hit 322 pound last year, a skyrocketing cost for ingredients forced a lot of restaurants to raise menu prices. They're now at about $1.60 a pound, wow. about half. Wingstop CEO credits demand for chicken breasts in helping to tamp down prices. Of course, wings are connected to chicken breasts. <laughs> yeah. well, we so hope. That's My goodness. Why more yeah, people right. trading, I don't trading eat the down from no, beef to chicken. But I do eat the breasts. So, <laughs> there you go. We'll take the good oh news. Oh, my God. Bertha. I love the both. I love, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually thinking of having wings for breakfast instead there, go of meals. For it. Go I'm for thinking it. of having a McDonald's cheeseburger. <laughs> yes. So I'll see you after the show, Bertha. Is, it's a health <laughs> show. Yeah. It's a health show this morning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you. All right. This morning in our climate control segment, it has been six months since the COP26 climate conference. That's where world leaders made ambitious pledges to limit global warning, warming. But are they on track? to meet those goals now that war and inflation dominate the headlines. Yeah, we're also going to take a look at a tree with inedible fruit that scientists believe could help solve world hunger. NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns has more in climate control. 
We start today's climate control tour with a timely new tool that allows you to check your home's wildfire risk. The First Street Foundation has released a one-of-a-kind nationwide wildfire risk model. You just enter your address and you'll get a fire risk assessment over the next 30 years. The scale goes from 1 to 10, with a 10 being extreme fire risk and a 1 minimal fire risk. Now, the obvious risks are there for all the western states. But how about a 91% risk for all the homes in Mississippi over the next 30 years? And what about Florida? 83% chance in Florida over the next 30 years. That shouldn't be much of a surprise. But how about my home state of New Jersey with a 63% risk of homes? As for the total number of homes at risk, the site says in the U.S. there are 72 million of us with homes at some level of wildfire risk. In the next 30 years, because of climate change, that number jumps 11%. To 80 million. Well, we are now six months past COPA 26, where 121 world leaders met in Glasgow to tackle climate change. Pledges were made, but the world has changed significantly since then. War in Ukraine, cost of living crisis, and product scarcity. All the while, the climate threat increases. Let's go over what was pledged and the status of the pledge. Well, number one, to phase down coal use. Right now, there are 2,400 coal plants operating worldwide, and another almost 200 coal plants are under construction. Number two, significant increase of money for poor countries to help them switch to clean energy. Well, $100 billion a year was promised to these nations. Not going to happen this year. The U.N. is hoping it will be met in 2023. Well, how about phasing out subsidies that lower fossil fuel prices? Well, with fuel prices as high as anyone has seen, there is zero talk of making them even higher by cutting subsidies. And the U.S. and China, we are the biggest two emitters, have vowed to cooperate. And I have crickets on that one. I haven't seen anything about that happening. And how about number five, to cut methane by 30% in 2030? Global monthly mean of methane right now is at a record, have a lot, revel, a record level high and climbing fast. Well, and the failed progress hasn't gone unnoticed. The COPA 26 president recently said, we need every nation to pick up the pace. We need every leader to show that their words were not hollow and their commitments were made with integrity. The next conference of parties, COPA 27, will be in November in Egypt. Well, for climate solutions, we often turn to technology, or in this case, nature itself. Ethiopia's false banana plant could be a game changer in Africa. It is similar to a banana tree, but its fruit is inedible. Instead, the food comes from the starchy pulp inside the trunk and roots. It makes porridge and bread. The key is the plant is drought resistant and grows all year in multiple climates. 60 trees can feed a family of five for a year. Even better, the leaves feed animals and the twines used for roofing. Scientists want to modernize the cultivation technique and think if done properly, the tree could feed 100 million people within the next 40 years. The false banana plant. Who knew? <laughs> false banana. Love it. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> All right. We know young kids like to play on phones. Yeah, well, one toddler ended up ordering more than two dozen cheeseburgers. We'll tell you how we did it. That's next. <laughs> Tom Cruise had quite the night as he made a long-awaited return to the 75th annual Cannes Film Festival. And while he didn't arrive by helicopter like he did at the San Diego premiere of his movie Top Gun Maverick, he walked the red carpet, received a surprise Palme d'Or, the highest prize awarded at the festival, and watched eight fighter jets fly over the European premiere of his movie. During a talk about his career at the festival, Cruise made his opinion about sending movies to streaming services clear, saying... That's not going to happen ever. When asked about why he does his own stunts, Cruz responded by saying, no one asked Gene Kelly, why do you dance? This was Cruz's first time at Cannes in three decades. He does nothing subtly, Samantha. Yeah, I'm not sure that's a fair comparison. Dancing, stunts, he is a dancer. <laughs> Tom's an actor, you know, whatever. But cool, good for him. It's always been impressive to me. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yep. Now, a Texas toddler gave his mom quite the surprise after pushing a few buttons while he was playing with her iPhone. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas shows us the doorbell ring that will make you laugh. Hello. Hello. Oh, it's for you. Texas mom Kelsey Golden was working from home with her two-year-old son Barrett when she got a confusing message from DoorDash on her phone. When they asked me, hey, your, your order is going to be a little bit longer because um, it's quite a big order. Kelsey had used the app to order lunch for her two older kids in the past, but she didn't remember placing an order earlier that day. I heard a door knock and I came out and it turns out they were at our house and she was like, is your 31 burgers? It's like, oh, wow, no, I didn't order these. That DoorDash delivery? 15, 16. A supersized order of cheeseburgers from McDonald's. 31. Kelsey didn't have to look far to find out who placed that order. Is that worth the, you gonna eat all 31? Sharing this image of Barrett 
on Facebook with the caption, apparently my two-year-old knows how to order DoorDash. You gonna share? You gonna ask if anybody wants some? I, I thought I locked the phone, but I, apparently I didn't because uh, then DoorDash came with 31 cheeseburgers, so. The family says two-year-old Barrett will not be put in time out. I don't even think he realizes he did it. He just does this with the phones. Mom describing it as a happy accident, leading to one unforgettable happy meal. What do you think about all this, kiddo? You gonna eat all this? Thanks to Tom Yamas for that report and for making us hungry. The family tells our NBC station KRIS they were able to share the cheeseburgers with others in the community. The kid's like, excellent. She yeah. thinks it was a mistake. Ha, 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 ha. Exactly. All right. Hey, the that neighbors benefit. <laughs> that does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.